Um, we have Emily Korat is here with CDM Smith, and she's going to talk about the future of biosolids. Um, her and I were just chatting. Um, PFAS is such a big topic, and I know we all understand how PFAS and biosolids relate. Um, but I do think that sometimes with the onslaught of the uh, PFAS material, that sometimes um, the rest of the biosolids gets uh, forgotten a little bit. So we're hoping to clear some of that up. So uh, Emily is an environmental uh, engineer from CDM Smith with a wide range of experience in wastewater processes, collection systems, and stormwater projects in the Northeast. Her fo uh, work focuses on existing wastewater treatment facility upgrades, wastewater process modeling, and regulatory compliance. So with no further ado, here's Emily. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, I know there's ice cream on the other side of this, so I will make sure to keep things moving and especially exciting after we've had lunch. So we're going to keep the energy high um, and talk about some of our favorite topics, which include PFAS and biosolids management. So this slide here, just a quick summary of what I'll be talking about today. First up, I'm going to go through a high-level overview of the PFAS regulatory trends that we're seeing across the United States and also here locally within New England. And I know, you know, the EPA is here to talk to us later, so I hope they'll, you know, shed some light on moving forward what those trends will be. Uh, and then I will talk about the state of the biosolids market here in New England and the impacts that we're seeing with PFAS. And then I will move forward into destruction and mitigation technologies that have, you know, the potential to uh, remove PFAS. And then I will take any questions. So starting with PFAS regulatory trends, as we all know, to date, the primary focus of PFAS regulation has been on water supplies. And this slide here shows a summary of the progression of the health advisories that have been issued by the EPA, which has ultimately resulted in the final MCL that was published just a few weeks ago on April 10th. Um, in the meantime, a lot of states have implemented their own guidance, notification limits, and MCLs, and those states are shown here in the map in red. And, you know, now we're seeing a lot of attention now shifting to water reclamation facilities, and we have a lot of state regulators and legislatures establishing rules and regulations that could have significant consequences on how we manage wastewater and biosolids. So the EPA has published a PFAS strategic roadmap, which outlines the EPA's approach to addressing PFAS. And some important dates are highlighted here on the slide, starting with the completion of the risk assessment for PFOA and PFOS. And the risk assessment will serve as the basis for determining whether regulation for these compounds in biosolids is appropriate. And I do want to note, you know, at the time of this a strategic roadmap, the, you know, toxicology and science for these two compounds was definitely the furthest developed, and we're, we're interested to see kind of now that we have a lot of other compounds uh, within the MCL, you know, how that will play out. Um, let's see. The final rule is anticipated in 2025 and 2026, and then that we're anticipating will be followed by a five-year compliance schedule. Also want to note the EPA recently published an interim guidance document on PFAS destruction and disposal just last month on April 9th. And this document does a really great job of identifying the remaining gaps in research and outlines some very clear steps to determine the most effective technologies for destruction and disposal of PFAS and PFAS containing materials. So I'm going to apologize in advance for the busy slide. There's a lot of information here, and I'll kind of point you to it as I walk through. So, you know, similar with drinking water, we've seen uh, states taking action in recent years to both monitor and regulate PFAS in wastewater and biosolids. We heard from Connecticut Deep this morning uh, about the monitoring requirements that are coming down the line. And the table here on the right is the summary of, you know, some of the other states in New England and the other monitoring requirements that we're seeing. Um, I'll move over, I guess, to the bullets on the left and talk a little bit about some of the state actions that have happened. As a lot of you know, Maine has, 
you know, prohibited land application of biosolids, and this has had pretty significant impacts on how we manage biosolids here in the area. And we've seen a lot of those biosolids also start making their way north into Canada. Uh, and, you know, we have now seen Canada issue uh, interim standards. The one here is the 50 parts per billion for PFOS, and we are expecting additional standards uh, really any day now for some additional PFAS compounds. I also wanted to highlight a few regulations uh, that have the potential to impact the biosolids market here in New England. The first on that list, MA2503, and I'm not going to read it because that's a tongue twister and I don't want to you know, take my face away from the microphone. But this uh, piece of legislation is trying to prohibit a gasifier at a small facility uh, in the south shore of Massachusetts, and if passed into law, would effectively prohibit the use of thermal technologies for biosolids. Um, so, you know, that is just here in Massachusetts, but, you know, we could see that, you know, trend spread throughout New England, and especially, you know, here where there is a lot of incineration could potentially uh, impact how we manage our biosolids in the future. Awesome. So now moving into the state of the biosolids market in New England. So New England is very unique when it comes to managing biosolids, you know, with our above average use of incineration. This graphic here uh, shows how biosolids is primarily managed in New England based on 2018 permitted capacity. So the blue pieces of the pie here are the incinerators we have here locally. Uh, the orange is our pelletizing facilities like Deer Island. And then the green slice of the pie that quote other is uh, landfill and composting. And I, you know, as we've all been experiencing, this market is changing due to a lot of factors that include aging infrastructure, stricter permits, political pressures, and our drive towards beneficial reuse. This here is a um, summary of how each state within New England manages their biosolids. And this chart is based on the 2018 biosolids data project and is like percent total by state of biosolids. So as you can see here, you know, Connecticut and Rhode Island rely heavily on incineration, while some of the northern New England states like Maine and Vermont rely more on landfilling and this quote other category, which includes beneficial reuse, agriculture, and class A biosolids. Um, this is based on 2018 data, so I do want to point out, you know, here we're seeing 60% of the biosolids in Maine being sent to a landfill, and the other 40% going to that quote other category, but with, you know, essentially the prohibition of the land application of biosolids, this 40% is now going into other facets of the biosolids market, just adding additional pressure. Okay. Awesome. So this year we have the biosolids management cost impact before and after PFAS regulations. So the x-axis here is, you know, all the facilities that were included in this survey. And then on the y-axis we have the management costs. So the blue bars are the dollars per wet ton, let's stand back a little bit, in 2018, so the quote before times of PFAS. And then we have our orange bars and the dollars per wet ton after PFAS. The you know, background colors of this graphic are differentiating how the facilities are managing their biosolids. So in green, we have, what do we have? Um, sorry, okay. So let me take a look at those graphs. So we have, um, land application, and then here in blue, we have incineration, and then in that yellowy color, we have uh, landfilling. So I want to point out that we see the facilities that rely on land application did see a larger impact in their d disposal costs, and on average, we have seen a 74% increase in the disposal management costs. 
And I also want to back up the 2021 cost information was based on a study that CDM conducted and worked with NEBRA, NACWA, and WEF to conduct an evaluation of the impacts of PFAS regulations. And the regulations that were included in this evaluation varied in nature from those directly impacting biosolids management to others that re regulated groundwater and inadvertently impact land application programs. So this here is showing the historical sludge escalation disposal costs over time. So on the x-axis we have, you know, our year and then the y-axis disposal costs, so dollar per wet ton. So what in 2018 was about $300 per dry ton, we now saw in 2021 was costing on average $550 per dry ton. Also want to note this is average and we are seeing costs that are much, much higher than this. We have a facility in Massachusetts that saw a bid for $945 per dry ton. And so we have a lot of facilities, especially the small facilities, you know, getting impacted pretty hard um, by biosolids and PFAS regulations. Okay. So destruction and mitigation technologies. Before I jump into the details of all the technologies, I want to first define what complete destruction and incomplete destruction is. So complete destruction, we have the breaking of this carbon fluorine bond to ultimately mineralize PFAS completely. Um, once it's broken through analysis, we wanna see these three lines of evidence. So the disappearance of PFAS, the generation of fluoride, and the reduction of total organic fluorine concentration. With incomplete destruction, we have a lot of complicated chemistry that I certainly don't know all the details of, and I want to note this, you know, transformation reaction here is one of many PFAS compounds that we see uh, in biosolids. And um, yeah, we're ultimately getting, you know, kind of the byproducts and precursors of PFAS compounds. So, so this slide here is a summary of kind of the thermal processes uh, that some we're very familiar with and are well established in the industry and some of which are you know coming down the line and have the potential for PFAS destruction. And this slide here is those same technologies but on a technology readiness scale. So you know f I want to point out you know drying, thermal hydrolysis and incineration have been around for a long time and have moved you know taken many years to kind of move through this process, starting with an idea, moving into pilot, through full-scale trial and regulatory compliance, and into commercial use. Uh, we have gasification and pyrolysis here that's firmly within kind of our full-scale trial phase. We have supercritical water oxidation, again, within full-scale trial. And we have hydrothermal liquefaction, of which we're seeing a lot of promise with pilot units, and then open cell uh, and I included open cell here highlighted in red because this ultimately did, this technology did get shelved by the business that owned it. So, you know, it is very difficult and takes a lot of money and time to get these technologies off the ground. So drying is, you know, pretty simple technology. We're applying heat to, you know, get a mass reduction in our biosolids. These uh, products, you know, can be then used for Class A beneficial reuse or landfill cover. Um, and often drying is kind of this precursor step for some of the other advanced thermal technologies that we're now seeing come on the market. Thermal hydrolysis is a process that applies high pressure and temperature to break down biosolids using steam. I want to note this is not a PFAS destruction technology. It's included here to, you know, demonstrate a technology that kind of within our, within recent memory, I don't want to say within our lifetimes, has come from an idea, you know, into now widespread commercial use. Uh, so 
this technology, you know, started with the pilot full-scale trial uh, with a you know facility in Norway back in 1995, and then ultimately the first U.S. application for DC water became operational in 2014. Next up, we have gasification and pyrolysis, and this includes the thermal decomposition of organic material through the application of heat without extra air or oxygen. Uh, we have the byproducts of this product include syngas and biochar. Uh, drying must be done usually ahead of the gasification and pyrolysis process, and we have seen, you know, the photos here are showing our full-scale trial units we've seen and additional research is ongoing to confirm and shed light on the fate of PFAS through this process. Oh, and there's a photo of the, the resulting biochar. So this table here, we have a summary of the gasification and pyrolysis units at various stages of implementation within the US. I think Silicon Valley Clean Water, and I believe Ed or the, yeah, Edmonds, Washington, are currently the, the only operating gasification and pyrolysis units that are relying solely on biosolids. We've seen a lot of other units that do have uh, supplemental materials like wood chips being added. Um, all right, next up, incineration, one that a lot of people in this room are extremely familiar with. Uh, this technology has been utilized for decades. Uh, we have been seeing some fluidized bed incinerators that are still being permitted and built within the U.S. Uh, and we are also seeing you know, more advanced incineration technologies like the ERS unit that has this higher operating temperature to potentially achieve PFAS destruction. And there is a lot of research and attention going to this. Next up, supercritical water oxidation. It's an advanced oxidation process that relies on bringing uh, biomass you know, up to this critical point of water uh, to allow for rapid oxidation. Um, we have you know, a lot of manufacturers on this slide listed here, but I wanna bring attention to 374 water, uh, which is one of the units that is focusing on the wastewater and biosolids market. Um, you know, the interesting thing with supercritical water oxidation is there's very high temperature and pressures that we're not necessarily used to seeing here in wastewater, uh, so 700 degrees Fahrenheit and 3600 PSI. Uh, and this technology, we, uh, you know, have been seeing some full-scale trials uh, come onto the scene. Hydrothermal liquefaction, uh, it's a depolymerization process that converts wet biomass into biocrude oil. Again, at a pretty high temperature pressure process. Uh, we can use this oil directly or blend it uh, with commercial fuel. And we do see pretty large solids reduction and a large amount of energy recovery and you know, effluent water that can then be recycled. And you know, this technology has been proven at the pilot scale, and they are currently kind of looking for partners to move this technology into that full-scale trial phase. Harlan Water Technologies, or Heliostorm, uh, that's an ionic gasification process. Uh, so I guess imagine like a plasma arc you'd see from a welding unit. Uh, so you have these like modules uh, that create plasma arcs, and the biosolids are dropped from the top of the unit and fall through. Uh, this can then achieve, you know, a high temperature and residence time that's needed to achieve PFAS destruction. Um, I want to point out, you know, the research is still ongoing with this uh, type of technology to confirm that we are achieving complete destruction of PFAS. Uh, the photo on the slide here is showing the pilot unit at the Heartland Water Technologies facility. Um, but it currently is showing promise, and hopefully we can, you know, see it in a full-scale trial someday soon. So here's some just final thoughts uh, 
first up, you know, the biosolids market in New England is stressed. This quote, stool of landfill, land application and incineration, this stool is wobbly. Um, the market pressures that are kind of creating this wobble <laughs> includes aging infrastructure, the increase in management costs and stricter regulations. I wanna, you know, point out with these risk assessments, more than a standard analysis is needed to evaluate PFAS leaching from biosolids and the transformation reactions that occur. And that we, you know, piloting is a critical step in evaluating the efficacy and cost effectiveness of destruction technologies. And, you know, th I didn't really talk too much about this, but there are readily implementable approaches that can mitigate PFAS, you know, upstream of these facilities. Um, and that you know, we're seeing source reduction continue to be the most economical mitigation strategy. And I think with that, thank you very much. I'll take any questions. Yes, sir. That's good. Thank you. We do have a question. Yeah, I think you called it hydrothermal liquefaction. Yes. What's the, is that a ener net energy gain or loss if you do that? Because you do produce a fuel at the end, right? Correct. Let's see. So I will say I'm not, you know, intimately familiar with hydrothermal liquefaction, so I'm happy to give you my business card, follow up with you after on uh, some details of this gen of fuel uh, technology, but I don't know that answer on the top of my head. I'm sorry. Thank you. You mentioned in your final thoughts that um, mm -hmm. source control is a big you know, area where we can help mitigate PFAS introduction into our wastewater systems. Where have you seen some of that um, applied? Yeah, so we've seen that in a lot of industrial pretreatment programs. So in monitoring and being able to identify you know, where these sources of PFAS are and then implementing you know, some what would be considered more drinking water technologies like granular activated carbon or ion exchange units upstream of the discharge into our collection system. And I believe it was in Michigan we saw a facility, you know, apply that through an industrial pretreatment permit and, you know, orders of magnitude reduction in PFAS at the downstream wastewater treatment plant. Awesome, thank you.